Welcome to Introduction to Logic, Unit 4, Lecture 1, Part 1. In this lecture, you'll learn how to apply simple, valid argument forms to verify or prove the validity of ordinary language arguments. We'll be building on everything we learned in Unit 3, so if you find yourself struggling with any of the basic concepts as we get started, you probably need to go back and review the previous lectures on symbolizing ordinary language propositions and setting up truth tables. We'll begin with four simple argument forms which we discovered in the last unit. Three of our arguments, which we are going to call rules of inference, are based on material implication. In modus ponens, we affirm the antecedent of a hypothetical claim to derive the consequent. In modus tollens, we deny the consequent to derive a, a denial of the antecedent. And in hypothetical syllogism, we combine two hypothetical claims to derive a third hypothetical claim. The fourth argument form is a disjunctive syllogism, which allows us to derive a disjuncted alternative with necessity. Of all the valid forms of ordinary language arguments, none is more well known than modus ponens. Starting from a single conditional statement, all we need to do is to affirm the antecedent as the second premise in order to conclude the consequent. This is because, as we've already learned, the antecedent of a hypothetical claim is supposed to be a sufficient condition for the consequent. Whenever I have the sufficient condition, I should have the consequent. Symbolized, the validity of the argument is even more obvious. In this case, D is asserted to be a sufficient condition for H in premise 1. In premise 2, we're asserting that indeed D is the case. Thus, it must be the case that H. Notice that we've introduced a new symbol, three dots in a triangle, to indicate the concluding line of the argument. This is shorter than writing out the word conclusion and also helps us to avoid confusing the letter C with a premise in the argument if we were to use that as shorthand for the word conclusion. Of course, we've already worked the truth table for modus ponens, so we know it's valid, but just to reinforce our memory, let's look at it again. Once the truth table is complete, we can see that there are no worlds in which all of the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. Thus, we know any argument of the form, if p then q, it is the case that p, therefore it must be the case that q, will be valid. Our second implication rule, or valid argument form, is modus tollens, the way of denial. Like modus ponens, we begin with a hypothetical claim, a material implication, but this time we deny the consequent. Since the consequent of any material implication is supposed to be a necessary condition for the antecedent, if we negate that condition, we negate the possibility of the antecedent. Symbolizing the argument, and putting it in standard form makes the form of this argument very clear. Like modus ponens, we've already done a truth table for this argument, but let's look at it again just to reinforce our understanding of its validity. Remember that in order to be invalid, we need at least one universe where all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. Since that doesn't exist, we know that this too is a valid argument form. And from now on, we just need to look for an argument of the same form, shape, or morphology, and we'll know that it's a valid deduction. Our last argument form, based on material implication, is the hypothetical syllogism. In symbolic form, the logic of the inference is clear. If you've not already noted it, see how the conclusion of the argument contains no information that is not already contained in the premises. 
This will always be the case with deduction, and it's the most important distinction between deduction and induction. In deduction, we draw conclusions based on information we already have, but induction allows us to make a leap from what we know to what we don't, but we'll come back to that difference again later on. Looking to our truth table for this argument, we are, as always, looking for a line where all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. Notice that I've used universal variables for the truth table because it's the form of the argument that makes it valid, not the actual content of the ordinary language argument. Since no line shows true premises and a false conclusion, we know that this argument form will always be valid and can therefore be adopted as a universal rule of implication. Our final implication rule for this mini-lecture is the disjunctive syllogism. It's essential to keep in mind that the disjunction of two statements tells us that at least one of the disjuncts must be true, but it doesn't tell us which one is true. Thus, in order to derive anything from a disjunction, we're going to have to eliminate one of the possibilities. In its symbolic form, the logic of the disjunctive syllogism becomes quite clear. Since I don't know whether C or F is true, but I do know that one of them must be true, if I eliminate one of the possibilities, exactly what we're doing in the second premise, I know that the alternative must be the case. Our truth table, which we've already seen in the last lecture, bears out the validity of the argument. Two quick things to keep in mind about this argument form. Notice first that we can't affirm one of the two disjuncts to derive a conclusion. If we were to affirm C instead of denying it, we would have no reason to infer anything whatsoever about F. Disjunction only tells me that one of the two is true, so if I'm affirming that indeed one of them is true, I would know nothing at all about the other. And if you were to do a quick uh, truth table for that, it would verify the invalidity of such an argument. And of course, I couldn't conclude C either, because I've already asserted it to be true as a premise, and simply concluding what you've already asserted is viciously circular reasoning. This, that is, you, you wouldn't have any inference at all in that case, but merely a rep repetition of what you've already said. Now, the second thing to note about disjunctive syllogism is that we adopt as a procedural rule to only deny the left-hand disjunct. We'll find out later on that we can actually switch the disjuncts around without violating the logic of the premise. But for now, we'll just say that you can only deny on the left-hand side. So, like our other arguments, disjunctive syllogism is valid, and it can also be adopted from now on as a standard rule of implication. It's important to keep in mind that in natural deduction, we're only looking for the form of the argument and not the content. While the latter will determine the soundness of an argument, it has nothing whatsoever to do with the validity, which is what we are focusing on here. So, we have to learn to focus our attention on the shape or morphology of the argument when thinking about proving its validity. Also, we have to keep in mind that ordinary language arguments are almost never presented in standard form, and they may also include premises that are altogether irrelevant to the conclusion we're drawing. We have to learn to ignore irrelevant premises and find the elements within the argument that contain the valid form required to make it a good argument. Concentrating on form for the moment, let's consider this argument. At first glance, this may not look like one of our arguments at all. But notice that the main operator of the first premise is a material implication. That means what lies on the left side of the horseshoe is the antecedent of the premise, while what's on the right is the consequent. We could even replace each with universal variables. The first premise is really simply if P, then Q. Next, Notice what the second premise states. It merely affirms the antecedent of the first premise, in other words, P, 
Likewise, the conclusion is just Q. See? What we've got here is a modus ponens. And it wouldn't matter if the premises weren't in the right order either. Look, we've got all the elements to make a modus ponens regardless of whether or not the person is giving us the argument in the right order. In this second syllogism, the form may be a little easier to spot. Notice the repetition of W in both premises, but not in the conclusion. Also note that the elements of the conclusion is the antecedent of the first premise, while the consequent is from the second. If we put it into universal variables, we'd have if P then Q, and if Q then R, therefore if P then R. This is a hypothetical syllogism. Let's see if you can identify this one. Look at what's happening in the premises and conclusion. Sure, the premises are out of order, but it's clearly a modus ponens. What about this case? Do you notice how the second premise denies the consequent of the first? If you did, then you'd recognize this as modus tollens. By now, you're surely getting the hang of it. This one should be fairly easy. Since our conclusion is a material implication, and both premises are material implications, the only thing it could be, that's right, hypothetical syllogism. Let's look at one last example before we move on. At first glance, this looks like a mess. If you don't see it right away, look at the conclusion. Next, look for the conclusion in the premises, and you'll see that not G is in premise 1. But our conclusion is, it's not the case that it's not the case that G. So we have two clues as to what this argument might be. First, our conclusion comes from the antecedent of the premise, and it's the negation of the antecedent. There's only one argument form we know of that yields the negation of the antecedent. That's modus tollens. Taking everything we've learned so far, we're now ready to apply these definitions and rules to validating ordinary language arguments. To do this, we first write each statement of the argument on a separate line. But instead of ending with the conclusion, we'll separate it from the argument by writing it to the right-hand side of the last premise, preceded by a single forward slash. For example, here we see a three-premise argument, which would read, if A then B, either C or A, it's not the case, or sorry, it is the case that A, therefore it is the case that B. We now want to apply our rules to this argument to see if B validly follows from premises 1, 2, and 3. Remember that in ordinary language arguments, we may get junk premises that we don't need. So just see if you can spot how, using our rules of implication, we could prove that B would have to follow from some combination of the premises. If we ignore premise 2 altogether, we'd see that premise 1 and premise 3 form a modus ponens, which would allow us to conclude B. We write this on the next line of the argument, then indicate which rules were used to derive that conclusion. In this case, we were able to prove that B does in fact follow from the premises in one easy step. But trust me, it won't always be so easy. Also, note that we didn't need line 2 in this argument at all. It's just junk. But that's going to happen. Let's try another one. Again, let's keep it to a simple four-statement argument. Three premises and a conclusion. When validating someone's argument, all we're trying to do is 
is to show that their conclusion, in this case, it's not the case that A, will follow somehow, necessarily, from the given premises. The first step is always to identify where in the argument the conclusion is located, then apply our rules of implication until we find a way to prove that that conclusion must follow. In this case, we don't have it's not the case that A in any of our premises, but we do have A in premise 2. So what can we add to premise 2 to get not A, and how would we do that? We might be tempted to make a hypothetical syllogism out of premises 1 and 2, but notice how B is in the consequent position of both statements, so that's not going to work. That only leaves premise 3, which, on closer inspection, will allow us to derive not A using the modus tollens rule. So, on line 4, we write down what we've proven and what we used to do it with. Our next proof is going to take a few more steps, as we'll see. But as you do more practice applying the rules of inference, it will get easier and easier. All right, let's get started. The first thing that we want to do is to find the conclusion in the premises, and here it is. But in order to get B out on a line by itself, that is, to conclude it, we'll first need to secure not A. Looking through the list of premises, I find not A as the consequent of premise 2. But in order to derive that, I'd need not C to perform a modus ponens. But alas, I don't have not C anywhere in the argument. I do, however, C as the antecedent of premise 3. And since I have not D on line 4, I can derive not C from lines 3 and 4 using the modus tollens rule. Next, I can use lines 5 together with line 2 to show how I could derive not A using modus ponens. Finally, I can put line 6 with line 1 to prove B. It does indeed follow from this set of premises, using disjunctive syllogism as the last step of the proof. In this mini-lecture, you've learned the first four rules of implication, or valid argument forms, which we can use to determine if any ordinary language deductive argument is valid. You've also learned how to set up and work a proof, or a demonstration, of an ordinary language argument. In our next mini-lecture, we'll learn four new rules of implication, simplification, addition, conjunction, and constructive dilemma, which will add even more tools to our growing toolbox of logical argument forms. We'll see you next time.